Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. So my guest this week I will introduce in a moment, but first I want to talk about the sort of structure of this week's episode. So uh, I'm lucky to get a lot of feedback from enthusiastic listeners to Perpetual Chess, and one request that I've gotten a lot and haven't had a chance to meet until now is to have guests who folk, who are adult chess players focused on improving. And that's something I've wanted to do, but it's a little bit trickier to find the right guest than to just you know, reach out to a grandmaster, an international master, or a chess author, or something like that, because often it's not going to be a grandmaster who is, uh, you know, the best exemplar of how to improve for an adult chess enthusiast. So I found a good guest, and this will be a regular feature, not like a reg- this will be a semi regular feature, I should say. So from time to time, we'll also have other guests who we just focus intensely on how to get better at chess. And like I said, I found a great candidate. So we'll get into why that is momentarily. But first, uh, enough babble, let's introduce our guest. So my guest is Andrzej Shivda. He's a candidate master from Poland. Uh, and he just had an incredible result in a chess tournament. So, and he's been, he's been improving for a while, but what got my attention was he's been rated about 2100 FIDE, as he said, for about 20 years, and then just had a 2550 performance rating, uh, and earned an IM norm, and also had a, a couple good results to, to start his FIDE rating moving in the right direction even before then. So we'll get into more about his background and how he did it, but welcome, Andre. Uh, hello, thanks for having me. Sorry, I'm not used to giving such a lengthy introduction. I felt like it was like a Shakespearean soliloquy, but I just wanted people to know what this will be about. So we're going to go deep on chess improvement. You wrote this amazing chess Reddit thread describing your result and talking about your methods. So uh, we're going to dig deep into that. But first, let's just uh, touch a little bit about your background. So you you live in Poland, Andre. Where in Poland are you? Um, I live in the southwest Poland, which is between Wrocław and Katowice. It's called the Opola region. I live in a small village, uh, like one hour by car from Wrocław. Okay. Yeah, my Polish geography is not great, but it sounds nice. It sounds uh, pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I live close to a very nice forest, and it's a pretty, uh, pretty area here. And you you managed to compete in chess tournaments despite not living in sort of a, a chess hub. So how do you, how do you pull off getting to tournaments, Andre? Well, you know, one one hour with uh, with car is not really that much. So I can easily drive somewhere like to Wrocław or to Katowice, where my last tournament took place. And usually in Poland, you have, we have good connections between cities. And if I want to go, like uh, earlier this year, I played in Austria. There are good flight connections also, so no, it's it's not a problem overall. Uh, and during the week, uh, I try to go to Wrocław if I can at least once for to play one tournament. But sometimes I I stay home like for two or three weeks, and you know I'm just tra- training. Okay, and and for listeners, one of the reasons I thought Andre would be a great first guest in this adult improver series is first of all because I think he's on the higher end of the rating spectrum in terms of uh, of guests that will have. Uh, that that are really working hard on their chess. He's like I said, he's been twenty one hundred free day, and now he's already over twenty two hundred. Um, and another reason is Andre is uh, married with kids. He has t- two kids, and he works. Of course, you're a programmer, right, Andre? Yeah, I'm a programmer, like a part time programmer now, because I also run a company with fifteen programmers. Uh, so oh, during the day, I play the role of the CEO, whatever that means, and uh, and a programmer. And yes, I have a wonderful wife and two kids. Uh, so this this is usually, and I'm trying to practice chess. So this takes all, all of my time. Yeah, and I thought that part of the reason that you would be a good fit is because you have some of the primary obstacles that adults encounter. Like even though, I mean, as a teenager and even in college there's clearly time to study. And then as people get older and their responsibilities grow, it becomes harder. But it's not like you're, you know, you're not some unique case where you're just able to spend 40 hours a week studying chess, but but you make the time to do it. So 
So how do you do that? How do you carve out the time to to really work on your chest? And we'll get into how you work on your chest in great detail uh, later. Yeah, so just to be clear, I, I've had those obstacles for, you know, the kids are already uh, seven and four years old. Uh, so I didn't really have that much time, but now I somehow found it and I was uh, actually, you know, wondering how I did it you know, now retrospectively. Uh, I think part of this is because I, I work remotely, uh, so I don't spend any time commuting. Uh, so that's like one portion of time that I'm able to use somehow. Mm, second thing is uh, that I, thanks to working remotely, I'm able to spend time with my kids over the day. So I don't work in like one big block of time. Uh, instead, I just choose like two hours working sessions. And in between them, I spend time with my wife and with my kids. So overall, my work takes longer over the day. But thanks to that, I can, you know, sneak something in in between. And with chess, uh, I found chess. I found the best moment for training chess in the, early in the morning and I'm not a morning person. So that was my big sacrifice in my life that I'm waking up much, much earlier now. And I try to, to use like one or two hours of my time for chess early in the morning because I set the chess goal to be my, like one of my biggest priorities in the last three years. And, you know, if it's a big priority, then let's do it the first thing in the morning so that I'm happy, you know, accomplishing at least some of my, uh, milestones early in the day, and then I'm happy to continue with my you know, normal working day. Yeah, and you had a, I mean, and you mentioned in the Reddit thread that, and I'll, by the way, of course, I'll link to the Reddit thread in the show description for anyone listening who I, I definitely recommend you check it out. But you, um, you've made a few YouTube videos, and in, in an older one, you mentioned you sort of had benchmarked goals. Your first one uh, was to to get FIDE, your FIDE rating over 2200, which you seem to be on, what you were did on schedule. And now you've yeah. got the FIDE ma- master goal and the big one, the international master goal remaining. Um, so how, how did you decide? On, I mean, it seems, it seems intuitive, but what made you decide that you needed explicit goals? Uh, it's not something that I've had like from the beginning. Uh, so three years ago, I, I had decided that I want to do something with my chest because, you know, I was getting beaten by young players, uh, by, you know, players that I, I thought I should I should be able to win, and I, I somewhere inside of me I, there was this will to, to you know there was this wish to get better at chess. Um, so the, the goal at the beginning was just to have twenty two hundred. That was my original goal, to be just truly honest. But then I thought, well, no, that was my goal for like forever, and it never worked. So maybe I, I need more bigger goals. So then I, I I came up with this idea that maybe I you know. Why don't I think about you know international master? But from the beginning, I think I wasn't lying to myself, and I thought like this is impossible. Basically, it's just cheating myself so that I get to the twenty two hundred at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, and somehow, you know, later I kind of believed that maybe I am is actually possible. And now I think it's <laughs> at least it's closer to reality than I thought three years ago. And the last three years was me improving in different ways. But the last six months, I think I was getting better and more disciplined about it. Yeah, it's inspiring stuff because we come, I'm not working on my chest right now, but we come from a similar base. I mean, I'm, you know, I've been over 2200 free day, but I'm 2170 right now or something. And to me, as as an adult with kids, uh, international master seems fairly unattainable. Um, so the fact that you, I mean, and the fact like, Putting up a twenty five eighty performance in a tournament seems un- unattainable to me, to be honest. So I'm I'm quite impressed. So I think it's time to dig into the the nuts and bolts of of what you do. So first of all, how many hours a week do you manage to spend uh, studying chess, Andre? Mm, I think at the minimum it's like ten hours. Uh, maximum might be I don't know fifteen. Uh, it depends. If, if I'm getting closer to a very important tournament, like I'm trying to play at least one big tournament every two months, uh, then it might be more, um, maybe closer to 20 hours. I'm not sure. I, I'm not really tracking this. It's just, you know, early in the morning, I spend like one hour to two hours. And then whenever I have uh, some time available, I try to solve some strategy or look at some interesting games. Uh, so it might, you know, and I'm also, as probably many of us uh, are addicted to playing online chess. So, this takes a little bit of time too. 
Yeah, I was going to ask. I've got a list of topics to hit and whether they're good or bad for chess. So uh, do you feel like online chess, if you're playing Blitz online, do you does that count as studying in your book? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that's sort of where I come down. Like, it's not nothing, you know, it's... Mm-hmm. It's it's not useless, but it's certainly it's not the same as trying to solve a study or cracking open a book or something like that. Especially it it, it comes down to if you're reviewing your games or not. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, the only the only way when I think it's useful in my case for me specifically, it's when after every game on the internet, I at least look uh, at the opening line in the book later on or in my notes to see what, what went wrong, and then repeat that line somewhere. I'm using Chessable for that. Uh, so if that's the case, then yes, this is useful. But if not, I'm just playing you know, a series of blitzes, of blitz games, then usually it's not a good study. Yeah, it is a good way to, to drill openings. And yeah, I, for listeners, that, that would be one actionable tip that I think Andre has just uncovered. You should have a rule where if you're going to play Blitz online, uh, you should at minimum check the opening and maybe you can learn just one more if you just do that and learn one more move every time you play blitz of theory eventually it's going to add up to a lot and it also gives you a better sense of like sort of the chess zeitgeist what people are playing at a given time which when you're studying even if you look at the grandmaster percentages and stuff like that like at the club player level so much of what people play is determined by which videos are out and stuff like that and which chess books are out and you might not have your finger on the pulse but you'll sort of accidentally discover it if you're playing blitz online yeah exactly so uh, the two things that i usually do after, after when i'm in this mode of playing chess online and trying to improve my openings is that if I've had this line in my notes, then I repeat it. So I, 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 you know, I use Chessable, so it asks me you know, to review it. But if I don't have this line that I'm looking in my sources, where can I, when I, where can I find some good coverage of this line? Uh, whether it's, uh, I don't know, the quality chess books or the chess informant or chess publishing. And then I'm uh, kind of copying this line to my notes, to, to Chessable, and then I'm using it to learn uh, this line, so th- that's something. So after each game, that like that, that's usually like I don't know five additional additional minutes for for the opening at least. Okay, and for listeners who don't know, I mean, I think a lot will. But why don't you tell them a little bit about Chessable and how it works? Well, I consider Chessable to be one of the important parts of my improvement recently. Uh, you enter actually, you can buy some opening lines from them, and I did that for some li- for, for some openings. But most of the time, I'm just you know creating a private repertoire. They have this feature called private repertoire or private books. Each repertoire is a book, actually, in their terminology, and uh, it's it's uh, I think it's called drilling, right, in, in English. So yeah, it, it, you drill the opening. So you uh, you it shows you the, di- the diagram, and you need to play the moves, the whole line. So basically, it, I think it teaches you by uh, by you know memorizing it most of the time. So I, I put the most difficult lines into Chessable. The, the, the lines which require just knowing some schemas, I don't use Chessable for that. But the lines where the order is important, like I don't know some Nidorf lines or some Ray Lopez, then this is uh, Chessable is great for that. And it has this feature that you know you can. This has some nice gamification features. It's, it gives you some points when you come back every day. It shows it, it, it knows when to repeat the line, uh, so it's a really nice tool overall, uh, and I use it every day now. So I, I've been in that mode for at least one year now. Okay, and I know they, in addition to their opening stuff, they have like you can do some end game stuff. Are you using it mainly for openings? I use it only for openings. Yeah. Okay, and I, I saw you mentioned in the Reddit thread, or you mentioned somewhere on Reddit that openings are not they haven't been the primary emphasis of your study. So, like, what percentage? Um, if you could break down, I know this won't be exact, but break down what you study in what percentage? Like, how much is openings? I know you say you do a lot of studies. How much is studies? How much is just looking at grandmaster games and stuff like that? Mm, yeah, it would be hard to get to give you exact numbers, but. I always start the day and the training session with the studies. Uh, so I have those two books uh, by Kasparian, and one is the Domination Problems. I don't remember the title because it's in Russian, and I don't know how to translate it. Uh, so I use one one of the the Domination one it contains slightly um, simpler studies, and there is the original book by Kasparian with his own studies because the Domination collection is is it's a collection of other people, uh, so of other composers. 
so I when I when I feel I'm I'm super strong, then I'm using the Kasparian original studies. But usually they're very difficult and too difficult for me. And the domination ones are uh, more like they are more likely that uh, I will solve them. So at least two studies uh, in the beginning. Uh, each study is like I set the clock to ten minutes, and write and I write down the solution on a paper or somewhere, and then I compare it to the uh, to the original solution. Uh, then if I feel like I can do more, I have more time than I'm doing, you know, I don't know, two or three additional studies. But if not, then I'm usually trying to uh, get through one game or at least part of the game. And my main book right now, and it has been for for quite a while, is the Gary Kasparov on Gary Kasparov series. Okay. Uh, so Kasparov is probably the bigger, the biggest, you know, influence, influence in chess at least for, for me. So uh, I'm studying his books. Uh, his games, and also um, I'm using the Zurich uh, book as well. To you know, the Kasparov games are fantastic for uh, for calculation. So I'm focusing mostly on calculation overall. Uh, so I'm trying not to like all the sidelines. Uh, I'm not moving my pieces on the board when I look at the sidelines, but I try to imagine them in my. You know, I'm trying to visualize them in my head. Mm, only the main game is actually on my board. Uh, with Zurich is different because the Zurich book by Bronstein is, uh, you know, there is like more narration, more like strategic ideas. So I use that book mostly for understanding plans, structures, and so on. And, you know, it's kind of a classic. So I think it's good to know. Okay. So uh, on the studies, what happens if after 10 minutes, you're, you, if you feel like there's no way I have this, do you, do you still look it up at that point or do you keep going? No, I give up uh, because I think the main point is not only in actually solving. Well, I, I aim for solving exactly as it should be solved with all the you know, side variations. But uh, if, if I don't do it, I, I think the value is also in like focusing for 10 minutes on one position. I think that this is, this is like this is increasing my skills anyway, even if I don't solve it exactly. So if I don't find the solution, well, I'm not super happy about that, but I'm also not like, complaining too much and i just look at the solution in in the book and uh, okay i missed this idea okay i will try to you know look at this idea maybe in, in the future okay and are you doing tactics trainers in addition to working on your calculation or is all of your calculation work done by looking at studies yeah so studies are part of my regular training in the morning uh, while over the day when i have some time i i either go to the chess temple and uh, and i solve the tactics there uh, and I use in I use it in the un, not logged in mode because then it shows me simpler tactics, and that's the idea sometimes where I have I know only f- f- five minutes to just to just train on the simpler tactics because when you're logged in whether it's chesscom or leeches or or chess tempo they always show you those difficult tactics and I have the difficult parts done in the morning so it, usually over the day I I prefer to have uh, just to train my tactic skill in the in the simpler simpler solutions oh, that's so it. I. Yeah, I was just going to say that's interesting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought of that, um, but that makes sense because when I the the one bit of studying I sometimes do is tactics trainers on my phone. But even then, often like my kids are around and stuff, so I'm not really replicating game conditions by any means, you know. Whereas you're you're sort of conceding that point as well, but at least you're doing something that's, um, you know, if it's more of a sort of fast twitch thing where you're just trying to uh, access the pattern, that's like it's probably less uh harmful to the skill acquisition that you might have distractions yeah exactly and this this advice was given to me by my chess coach so and i it was like surprisingly <laughs> surprisingly good hint that you sh- i should be able i should use you know chess tempo without logging in uh when i when i tr- try to use some more complicated tactics i use chess.com on my phone and th- there i'm logged in and i'm using you know whatever is my current rating so i have this uh I think right, right now I'm, I'm somewhere between 24 and 2500 in chess tactics at, at chess.com. So I have this level of tactics to, to you know, trying to, to be solved. And have you seen your tactics rating rise over time since you stepped up your training regimen and started solving studies? Uh, yes, I, I got to the 25, I don't know, 2550 as my best peak recently. And I've been using chess.com for many years and I never was anything close to that. So I think it, 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 it like it shows there, uh, but uh, but tactics is important to me. Uh, but uh, you know I'm doing it only on the phone or on the desktop. Uh, 
And I don't think this is replicating the real playing condition, so I don't like treat it really seriously. Uh, I treat the part when I'm actually using the real physical board uh, in front of me that's like part of the serious training. Uh, because all other things are just not the same as you know being at the tournament. And for many years, I've been you know practicing only through some kind of screens. And I think in my case, it was important that I started using a, a real board. And then I'm when I when I go to a tournament, I'm like not surprised with whatever happens because we are now in the three D mode. Yeah, I think that's good advice for sure. Um, so getting back to the percentages, uh, and I also want to, there's so much to talk about. I also want to talk about your, your having a coach, but so your primary delib- like as they would call it, deliberate practice, uh, aspect of studying is studies. And you also mentioned the Zurich book when you're trying to work on your positional play. So what percentage like of your sitting alone in a room with a chess set out, what percentage of your time is spent doing studies versus doing uh, game reviews? Probably 50% on studies. I okay. Think. And the other half on game reviews? Yeah. Okay. So nothing on opening books. No, the, the openings and the tactics are like over the day. Okay. If I, if I find time over the day, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And talking about your coach, so you mentioned in the thread that uh, that made a big difference for you. Do you, do you want to say who your coach is or would you rather not say... Um, yeah, sure. Uh, it's a uh, grandmaster Bartosz Soczko from Poland. Okay. Uh, he's a really great, great coach, and you know, it's. it's could, really... you, could you spell his last name? Uh, Soczko. It's uh, S O C K O. Okay. And do you do uh, your five, lessons on Sky- on Skype or in person? It's only on Skype. Okay. Uh, and we've been having those sessions and a different, you know, speed or a different. Um, different times but it's it's now almost three years that we're working together okay and before our uh, gm so- soko did i say his name right uh grandmaster sochko sochko okay before Sochko-o. before working with grandmaster sochko did you have other coaches not really and when i was a junior when i was like 16 or 17 i remember mm, which was a long time it was like 20 years ago uh, uh i i was playing in the, you know all the junior competitions and i've had like two training sessions with uh international master oleg kalinin from ukraine mm, but back then it was like there was no skype or such thing so you, if i wanted to work with a trainer and i lived in a small village then you know it was a really big logistic you know challenge overall and fi- financial challenge as well so I've had like those two training sessions with both of them over like two days and they, they did bring me a lot of value, but it was only that. Apart from that, I've never had a, uh, any coach. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so what has been the primary benefit of working with your coach? Mm, I think I, I, I'm not sure if that was luck or I was deliberately looking for the style, but I think the second thing, so I, I think I was looking for this, this player like Grandmaster Sochko because he, his style is something that I wanted to have. And I, I, and I knew that I need to change a lot in my playing style because it wasn't... Like, the first thing, the first important problem I was trying to solve was not getting better at chess, but to get more fun from chess. And my style from, I don't know, five years ago was something that I just stopped enjoying. And I, you know, I didn't have fun from playing this kind of positions I was getting... Uh, and I was trying to find an you know an active act, active player, someone who you know tries to improve to, to get you know good position for pieces, not really close structures, more open ones. Uh, so with uh, with Bartosz Sochko, I, I got all the help that I wanted, uh, even more than that. So this this helped me you know changing my style. That was the most important thing. That's interesting. So how did you know that he was the right style? Um, he's like the one of the most uh, professional players in Poland, uh, and he's been like in the top five of pl- Polish players for many many years. So he and his wife Monika Sochko, they are like a, a marriage of two grandmasters. So they are very known, and I followed his his and her games too uh, for many years. So I, I knew his style, I knew his achievements. He he won some you know pretty big tournaments, in, for example, I think in Moscow one day. So, uh, and he was also a coach for the national Polish uh, chess team of men. Uh, so I, you know, I kind of 
knew that. So when I when I learned that it's possible that we can work together, it was like my my dream to work with Bartosz. That's great. Yeah, and as a brief aside, uh, how popular is chess in Poland? I know we have like Grandmaster Duda making a lot of noise recently, um, and some other super strong GMs. Is it is it a popular uh, activity there? I think it's it always was popular in, a, in many ways because you know Poland was part of this whole I don't know how to call it now Soviet area or something uh, where chess was always important. So, uh, but nowadays over the last I don't know ten years or five years uh, there is a huge and visible chess boom in Poland. Like there were I don't know whatever activities happening which led to this moment. But we now have so many kids playing. There are so many tournaments. And I think the whole wave is, is, in the end, the whole wave is bringing us stronger and stronger players at 2,000 level, 2,200 level, and so on. Uh, so overall, it's just, chess is very, pop- very popular, and uh, there are many players uh, who are international masters or, or trying to achieve international master titles. There are many grandmasters. Uh, as you said, um, Jan Krzysztof Duda is one of the, you know, the, young, the, the younger Polish players, and already he, he just won the Polish championship. For the first time, there is obviously Radek Wojtaszek, there is uh, Piorun, Gajewski, uh, Bartel. So there, there are many people that you can, you know, look at them and get inspired uh, because they are. And recently, they they also had some uh, um, team achievements. So the the Polish women uh, had uh, silver medals, the men had uh, bronze medal at some. I don't know whether it's Olympiad or World Champion. Uh, one of those important, you know, uh, competitions. So there's definitely people that you can learn from, and I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's building a big wave overall. That's great. And do you, in the tournaments that you've managed to play, have you left Poland for any of them, or are you mostly sticking to staying in Poland for the the tournament games you play? Um, I've played uh, in Ukraine. Uh, in Lviv, exactly. Lviv, I think Lviv might be the most like. Um, the best, I don't know, the, the average rating of people in this city might be the biggest in the, in the whole world, I think. They have, they have so many grandmasters in, in Lviv. So, and there is a, a very active um, or chess organizer and chess arbiter. His name is Alexander Prohorov. And he's organizing round robins and uh, many other chess tournaments. And he's very, also very popular in Poland, where he's coming to, to you know, be a chess arbiter. So I learned from him that he's organizing the round robins, and I and I participated in three round robins in Lviv. Uh, all of them were not successful at all. Uh, you know, the, I was very I was beaten by all the you know, strong um, Ukrainian international masters and FIDE masters, uh, but I learned a lot. So you know, I think in the end it was a good experience. Okay. So a couple more questions about studying. I mean, w- probably more than a couple, but I, but I want to talk about studying and I also want to get to this, uh, this recent success. I want to sort of uh, talk, have you take us through what, what it felt like. But first, let's, let's talk a little bit more about studies because I have a question from a uh, supporter of the podcast, Chris Wainscott, who, who asked, um, in the Reddit thread, you mentioned that you work on endgame studies and that at first, even though you weren't solving many, you felt the process helped. I'd like to know approximately how many you got correct versus incorrect. Uh, versus incorrect. Also, was there something that you did with the ones you failed to solve in order to better understand the themes for future attempts? Lastly, have you gone back to reattempt the ones you didn't get correct? Okay, so answering the last one, I don't come back to those studies. So uh, I just look up the solution and that's it. Uh, but I try to remember the idea, what kind of idea or you know the pieces coordination i missed uh, to solve that um what was the first question <laughs> sorry oh no problem um percentage you get right versus incorrect right. like uh, at the beginning right. versus now um yeah so the beginning it was like when uh, because the, the idea of solving studies was also from from uh, from bartosz sochka mm, so when he suggested this doing this to me uh, i think the the suggested setup was like one hour and I should do at least six of those studies. So it was like 10 minutes for each. And there were some of the sessions at the beginning where I spent one hour and I wasn't really, I wasn't, I was not able to solve any of them. So 0%, <laughs> which was very frustrating. Uh, but I think the studies they showed me, I didn't really, I I've never used studies really that much before. And I, when I learned about them and I really got deeper into them, then I understood how much I'm, um, 
how much I'm missing in chess and also how deep is chess overall and how not deep my thinking is. <laughs> right. So I, I, can I, I, I can relate to that. Yeah. So, you know, going through uh, one study and another study and yet another study and not being able to solve some of them, well, all of them, for example, that was like a big lesson. Uh, yeah, a big lesson to me. So I learned, you know, that there's a lot of things that I should improve. Now I think um, with the studies I'm getting, I don't know, with, with, the, with the studies from the domination book, I think I'm getting like, I don't know, 70 or 80 percent. And uh, by that, I'm meaning that I found the whole solution with all the you know sidelines, because sometimes the, there's like one, one main line, and there's nothing to, uh, additional to it. Sometimes you will see like five important lines that you should be able to see in order to qualify this as solving. Um, but with the Kasparian, the original Kasparian studies from that book that I own, uh, this is still like, I don't know, 30% maybe my success rate. So I need okay. to you know grow up to this. And uh, just for listeners, um, just to give you guys a little more context, so uh, solving studies is something that GM Sochko, um, Andre's coach, mentioned, but it's also something that's come up repeatedly from uh, you know strong player guests that we've had on Perpetual Chess, like uh, Mezgin Amanov mentioned it. I know Melik Satkachian uh, described it as a big point of emphasis. And besides recommending it, you just you know, if you interact with with strong players, you just you see them you see them studying it. Like I'm on Twitter, um, and you'll see them just tweet tweet out studies that they're working on. So it's a very active um, part of any strong players training, which is something I didn't know until I started this podcast. So um, if and when I study again, I, it's definitely something I'm going to emphasize. But do you happen to know Andre? Because you, you know you're you were 2100 feet a now you're 2200 feet a. But for people who are under the rating of 2000, do you know of any good study resources? Because I feel like often studies are for, for such, you know, they're, they're geared towards stronger players and some lower rated players listening may, may not know where to go for, for replicating what, what you've done. So the question is if I know some places where to go for, for that. Yeah, for studies that are, not, that are at a lower uh, difficulty level than Kasparian. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Okay, if anyone listening knows, uh, give give me a shout, and I'll um I'll put it on the web page and uh, tweet it out, and hopefully uh they'll have some resources. But for lower rated players, one thing I'll say is um just calculation generally. Like if you use like Mikhail Block's famous tactics book, something like that, you're not replicating what studies are like exactly because studies um studies often have you look. They I think that they. More than anything, they might train you to look for unusual moves. Um, so straight tactics trainers and ca- tactics books might not replicate that, that exactly. But the idea of doing deliberate practice on your calculation, I'd say, is um, supersedes even the importance of doing studies. Do you agree with that, Andre, for lower rated players? Yeah, I, I think it's like the it's almost like not really that secret, but like only the stronger players that do it. And maybe that's that's why they're strong. Uh, I, I I really regret all the years when I was not doing this, and I think it was it's part of a bigger problem. In, in my case, is that I I did work on my chess a little bit, but it was uh, I think it was in the book of Axel Smith when I when I learned about the idea of act, active learning and passive learning, and uh, with studies when you need to focus and really calculate, it's active learning. But if you just go through a book and just read some lines and not really trying to, you know, visualize it, not really trying to think hard about them, then it's more like passive learning and, you know, active learning seems to be getting better results to some people at least. So I'm definitely that case. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I would I would go so far as to say for, for all people, I mean, it has to be, it just, it has to be better to to be actively trying to assimilate the pattern to yourself rather than just having someone show it to you and hoping you remember. So let's do a bit of a sort of lightning round, Andre. I'm going to I'm going to name a we've we've touched on some of these already, but I'm going to name a few quote unquote study methods, chess improvement methods, and I want you to rate them on a scale of 1 to 10 of how useful they are for your chess. So 1 being totally wasting your time and, you know, 10 being super useful. So let's go with watching elite tournaments online. 
Uh, in my case, I treat it as a lazy learning, so two or three. Yeah, I agree. And again, with all of these, there's going to be some nuance that a number can't describe. Uh, Kostya Kovutsky uh, has a Patreon page that I recommend. And he wrote, I think I may have mentioned this once before, but he wrote a post about how incredible he was finding Grandmaster Lacoe's announcing. Um, and he was saying that if you really pay attention and really ask yourself questions while you're watching a broadcast, um, as he did when Lacoe recently covered an event, then you can actually get a lot out of it. Um, so he like accesses them on YouTube and uses it as a study method. So it's sort of whatever you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. But I, but generally, I agree with Andre. The way I watch elite tournaments is not going to help my chess. It's just basically for entertainment. So um, I would put a low number on that. Um, how about studying end games? Oh, that's a. Uh, I would consider the end game studies part of it. So ten. Okay, so you're not you're not working on a specific phase of your game though. Like you don't isolate middle games and end games. You just know that when you're solving studies, you're going to access both of them. Yeah, because I think it's, it's they they teach you the calculation, the visualization, but also the piece co- pieces coordination. I think is useful in all phases of the game. Okay, and we touched on this one, but online blitz. Uh, yeah, so it's like one, if nothing else, than playing. Uh, but if I if I use this mode with you know checking the openings and also or maybe going through the game and actually analyzing the game and seeing where I made mistakes, then it can go I don't know to five or six. Yeah, sounds sounds reasonable to me. Okay, uh, studying openings like from an opening book, let's say. Um, this is this is a tricky one because when I. Th- I was rebuilding my repertoire, and that was an important part of my training to get to the point where I don't really have big holes and I understand the positions. So so that was like a five or six when I was in that mode. Now I think it's uh, at this level where I'm playing and still a very low level. So that I don't think, you know, I, I do spend time on the openings, but it's more like close to this similar addiction as with playing online chess than a real need. So uh, I would say in that mode, when I was building, rebuilding my repertoire, it was like a five or six because it was important back then. But now it's like, uh, I don't know, three or four. Yeah. And, you know, regular listeners to the podcast have, have know that I, I'm, I'm in the same corner as you. Uh, I, I think that amongst um, lower rated players, openings are definitely overemphasized. Um, you're much better off just trying to you know, make better moves. And to the extent you study openings, it's more important to try to just understand a few ideas uh, rather than just memorize moves. Um, yeah, okay. I, I like the, the, you know, just the, just to finish up, I like the books where they cover openings plus the middle game because yeah. then you learn much more. So in that case, that's a big, much bigger value. But usually if you just see the, you know, the lines, then it's not of that much value for people at my level. Okay. Uh, studying games collection books. Oh, I like it, uh, but I like it when I finally found like the style I want to see or I want to get inspired. I love the series on Gary Kasparov on Gary Kasparov uh, because this is like the history of his achievements and getting through you know his his career from the beginning, what kind of opening choices he made, what kind of weaknesses he had he's had. Uh, this is amazing to me. So I, I like the, the the collections. So if I'm studying those games with not only just you know reviewing them, but trying to see what would be the next move, trying to guess them, trying to visualize all the side variations, sidelines. Um, then this is uh, nine probably. Okay, and this is with a chess set out, of course. Yes, yes. Okay, and how about exercise? By exercise, you mean like sport, like workouts? physical? Yeah, working on your physical fitness, doing uh, cardio. How important do you think that is for competing in chess? So that's a big one. Uh, uh, if you ask me, one, I don't know, two years ago or three years ago, I would say probably you know, two or three. Now I would. Uh, now if I have a choice to do endgame studies over the day or to go out to, to you know have a bike ride or something like that, so some kind of you know physical exercise, then it's I, I consider this, this a chest training as well. So uh, if we add this to my chest training, then you, you will I will see even more hours a week. Uh, so that's like a eight or nine, something like that. 
Yeah, I agree. And uh, for for listeners who who may be skeptical, just think about the the elite chess players that that you may have heard on Perpetual Chess or seen in other interviews. People like Hikaru Nakamura playing running half marathons, and you know Magnus Carlsen legendarily playing soccer and basketball basically on every single rest day of a tournament. And if you look at sort of the uh, the if you just look at the the form. Uh, physical form of the top players now and compare them to, you know, generations ago, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that, you know, you're, you're not just helping your heart and helping your lifespan, but you're helping your chess when you exercise. And it's not something to be dismissed because uh, so many games are decided by blunders and having that um, extra stamina just makes a huge difference um, in competing. Yeah, it's- it's super important. Huh? I do also this hack that I go in, uh, I consider this part of my chest training and I, I'm not really that person who is, you know, um, very in a good physical shape and who was doing sports for many years. I, I'm not that person, but recently I, I got, I got it improved and the hack for myself was to, uh, to, to, to convince myself that this is part of my chest training. And so yeah. And, and this is making a miracle for me because I'm now I'm motivated to do a bike ride or some workout Every day, and I'm also put. I'm taking you know, the 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 headphones with me, and I'm listening to your podcast every every time I go for a bike ride. So I'm you know training physically then, and I also like immersing myself with the all the fantastic chess stories from your guests. And this is like a good you know time spent on you know improving myself and also learning a lot. Thank you for saying that, Andre. The checks in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's get to. Uh, Time management, is that an issue for you when you play? Um, how's... Um, it was a big issue. Uh, do you want me to rate it as well somehow? Or... Uh, no, I feel like unless <laughs> unless I've... If you can think of something I, I missed from that list, I felt like I, I think I got all of the okay. major ways that people study. So let's okay. move on and just talk about it uh, generally. Yeah, so that was another reason why I really wanted to work with Bartor Sochko because he and uh, his wife, Monika Sochko, they are like my big people who I always, you know, I, I, I didn't, I never know, knew how they do it, but they always had better time than the, their opponents. And I think I, I learned a lot from Bartosz uh, on time management. It's still, I think it's, there's still much to be improved. There's still a lot for, for improving for myself, but it's it's much better now. Uh, so without, I'm not I'm not wasting my time during the game that often, and I'm I, I, I'm more confident now. But but that's probably because I'm you know feel I can calculate better now, and you know I'm trying to always have uh, when when it's possible uh, to have better time than my opponent. Uh, so this you know some some of some of us chess players probably are motivated by some. You know, psychological situations and for me it's important when I have a, a better time than my opponent for example so this is for me it's a you know a big a big skill to to you know to learn and did GM Sochko give you any specific advice that you found helpful to help improve your time management um I think it was like part of his overall strategy of teaching I would say uh like uh he it's even you know building the opening repertoire was also part of how to play so that I can play quickly. You know some openings are just so weird with the pieces coordination that you spend a lot of time because one mistake can put your pieces into I don't know to, into corner and you will never get them out. While some openings are just more classical and you know some differences between certain moves are not such a huge you know there is no such a huge difference. Uh, so I think this was like part of it. And also like sometimes you, Bartos tells me that, you know, just, you know, if a move look, looks healthy, you have improved a, a piece or whatever, uh, that's, that's a good move. Just, you know, play it, uh, certain positions, they require some more thinking, but usually, usually some, usually uh, the, the nice technique also he, he taught me is, you know, to play on autopilot, uh, some, sometimes, you know, it's just, you know, whatever you would play in the biz game, just, just play it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that was like I learned that there were many technique that I learned from Bartos that you know were actually focusing on time management directly or indirectly. And do you find it challenging? Like I know I've talked before about how I can 
I'll have, sometimes if I'm playing in a tournament, I'll have a voice in my said, head telling me to move, and I know what move I instinctively want to make, but I just can't pull the trigger. I just can't make the move. I just want to sit there and think more. Do you have you encountered that issue? Yeah, but I think I'm now more uh, optimistic about my intuition. I, I think uh, so. It, it's now when I see a good move and it seems to be active, and I know all the checkbox or all the all the checks from my list should be like covered here okay so am i making a threat or do i receive any threats that are that they should address uh, then you no know, i sometimes the intuition is okay but overall the you know calculation is super important so i'm trying not to be lazy about calculation so if it's a very critical position and you know lots of pieces are hanging then i will wait i will calculate but if i see that you know this is, the position is still not yet in the critical moment then I just, you know, am I making it forward? Am I, you know, putting my pieces actively? Then it's okay, let's just make this move. Yeah, it's it's such an important um, theme that has come up, that the ability to identify critical moments in a game and try to try to save your time for those moments rather than just sort of burn through it in random positions where, the, where the evaluation isn't likely to change that much based on uh, yeah. where... I, I, yeah, sorry. Uh, I think I'm I'm really still really bad at evaluating positions, but I learned not to be bothered that much about it. So sometimes I think I'm better when I'm not. Sometimes I think I'm worse when I'm not. Uh, I, you know, the, so the, but the choice is usually the, the important choice is like okay, I need to just play one next move. The evaluation is important, but it's not the key factor. I need to the next move is the key factor, right? So if I, for example, as for time management, if I if I have a choice of two moves and one leads me to a position which I kind of know or I have studied some books, some games recently about this topic, uh, or instead I can play a move which probably gives me a much better position, but this will be a very risky situation uh, and I'm not able to calculate it precisely, then I will choose the familiar structure. But if I'm able to, and I'm confident in my calculation skills and I and I feel that, that, that I know, I understand the, all the tactics around, and I will go for, for the more complicated one. Okay, that's good advice. So, Andre, let's uh, let's get to your most recent tournament. So, I know you had some success, just so listeners know, you had some success before then, too. Like, I know you made a YouTube video after a tournament where you had, like, a 2350 FIDE performance. So, your work was starting to pay off already. And, like I said, your FIDE rating was, was definitely moving strongly in the right direction. But then you had this breakout result. I mean, to, to get an IM norm as someone rated 2200 FIDE is very impressive. So what what came together for you at this tournament? <laughs> you know, it's still fresh for me. Uh, and it's you know, a recent event. And I, I really don't know. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to... I was, first, I was focusing on celebrating the, the, this fact... And sometimes I'm not even believing what happened. Uh, it's like so, like unusual. You know, I was I was rated as the last player in this tournament. I was twenty one sixty three. Uh, all the other people were almost everyone was above twenty three hundred. You know, and making this performance, uh, I don't know what happened. I, I think I there. I think it's if something happened, then it was in more about the psychological side than the actual skills because. You know, just before that tournament, I don't know, one month before, I was playing in Lviv in Ukraine, and I got hardly beaten by the Ukrainian players. I drew six games and lost three games, uh, and I and I lost some rating points overall. Uh, so, you know, over one month, you can't really improve that much. So, uh, so there was more like... I, I remember one conversation I've had with, with my coach, and I said, like, because usually when I start a tournament badly, uh, my coach says, and I'm, you know, Bartosz is very mm, helpful over Skype during the tournaments as well. Uh, so he's always trying to encourage me and so on. And, and I remember his advice when, when, when things are getting bad. He tells me, you know, Andre, just play on autopilot. Play quickly, play confidently. You know, things will be okay. And usually, usually this works for me. <laughs> so... So on that tournament, because that was exact, you know, not that long after that uh, uh, tournament in, Uk- at U- in Ukraine, I thought, why don't I start an autopilot? Like I, whatever that means, I just you know switch into that mode immediately in my head. Uh, so th- this was, I think, part of what could help. But also the important psychological factor here was that in that tournament I was so lower 
rated than all the other people, all my opponents, that I just, I was in that mode that I don't have to prove anything here. Like, they have to prove something, right? They have to beat me. So, like, whatever happens, I'm okay uh, in that tournament. And just to, I'm trying not to think about the rating points that much, but I knew that uh, I think two and a half points out of nine would give me, you know, already some rating uh, increase. So that's a low barrier. Uh, so I was like, okay, whatever happens, I think things will be fine. And I was playing in that mode for the whole tournament, and that gave me a good result. That's some, yeah, it's just incredible. So basically, trust your instincts, try to play quickly. And did you feel like your games, I mean, I don't know how much time you've had yet to, to go over them, but when you look at them, do you feel like you, you played noticeably better, or was it more just... Uh, not messing up sort of thing. I, I think it's like not, not messing up too much. Uh, I don't think that my game, my, my games, the quality of my games was really that much bigger than the, the other tournaments. I think I have, I didn't, I didn't make really, like I made only one blunder in the whole, uh, in the whole uh, tournament, in the, all of the nine games. And it was the only moment. So only for one move, I was in a lost position. And in all other games, I was never in a lost position. I was sometimes worse, but not in a lost position. So that was something interesting to me that if I don't make mistakes through, you know, just, you know, focusing on making good moves and they're not blunders, then, you know, I can have a result like that without any game loss. So I have made this blunder, but my opponents, my opponent luckily didn't notice it as well. So I I made a move and at the moment of pressing the clock, I, I noticed the tactics that I missed. And that was the only moment, and so I, I tried to, you know, the poker face and trying to not to show what I have just noticed. I was slowly uh, writing the move down, and I think that was the only moment in the game when he replied immediately something else. <laughs> so nice. That was the only moment where he was very quick with the reply, and then he missed it. And the, the game ended as a draw. That was, I think, the sixth round. And uh, who was the highest rated player you beat in this tournament? Um... That's a good question. Who was the first? Um, twenty three fifty. No, it's twenty three seventy two. Okay. Wow. And so when you're when you have an advantage against a higher rated player, do you have an urge to like? Did did you have the thought of offering a draw? Did anyone offer you a draw when you felt you were better? Like, do you have issues with, or have you had any issues with? Uh, um, you know, pushing an advantage against a stronger player because I know that's something that can be an issue for many chess players. Uh, yeah, so in the first round, I played against uh, Artur Frolov. Uh, that's an international master from Ukraine. He was also part of the Olympic team of, of Ukraine um, some years ago. And it was the first round, so I wasn't sure like how things will be going. And I was worse at the beginning, but then I was better than I had. A, I was pawn up in the ending. Um, but somehow I lost track. Somehow I, you know, I, already I've had some time troubles in the ending, and I was a pawn up. But that was very difficult to, um, uh, you know, to trying to like it was difficult to improve the pieces. It was there were some weaknesses. So overall, I think objectively my, my position was better, and probably I should be trying to play for a win. So I uh, that that's that's part of what I think I should improve. But I've had this like thinking in my mind so I, that I see a line where we can repeat, and I and you now that was a lazy thing on, for me, but I did that, so we did repeat, and that ended as a draw. So I was better, but I would just I, somehow I lost my confidence at that moment, and I was just okay. It's an international master. Uh, I shouldn't think like that. It's it's a wrong thinking, but uh, but I did that, and it, it ended as a draw. But it was in the first round, and I arrived, at, at, I arrived to this first round after um, six hours card drive, almost immediately to the game. So I was like happy anyway. Yeah, yeah. So you're not immune to those pressures either. I'm just certainly not either. But it's at least something to have have in your consciousness to be aware of and look to improve. And you know, certainly as you have results like you did, um, that's some. You know, it it starts to come more naturally. I would think. Yeah, and as for the drawing tendencies, I do have this problem that sometimes when I'm even better, but I'm playing against a stronger player, I, I have this like tendency to, you know, offer a draw or you know find a line where we can force a draw, and I think that's a that's a weakness on my side. I, I need to improve on that. 
Uh, in this tournament, it happened to me in the first games where I like didn't know that it, things will go well. So in the third round, I was playing against Pavel Tetzlaff, and he's like one of the young prodigies in Poland. He's he he's I think he has I don't know silver or bronze medal in world championship uh, under fourteen or under sixteen. I'm not sure. Uh, and I was playing with him, and I, I, this was, this was actually a very equal position. But I know my thinking, and I have to be honest with myself that I was thinking about how to make it a draw. Uh, I wasn't really thinking that much about you know how to win that game, and that's that's again something I have to improve. Uh, but once things, once I started winning in this tournament, I was like, okay, I will now win everything. Nice. <laughs> I, I, I will try winning everything, and even the, in the last round when I was playing in. Uh, in the last round, I already have my, I, I had my I am norm secured. It was already there, uh, so and also around before the end, uh, I knew I was the tournament winner. So I was like playing for really nothing important, but I was focused on winning, and I win, and I won that game as well, the last game. Uh, and the the eighth round, the eighth round was important psychologically for me because I knew in the eighth round. So over the tournament, I was trying not to think about the I am norm. I was trying not to think about winning the tournament. It was a bit difficult because all my friends were like contacting me through Messenger and other ways and saying, "Hey, hey, you're doing so well. Remember, just one, you know, half a point, and you will get a norm and something like that." And I was like, "No, no, no I don't want to think about that." Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, in in the eighth round, when I knew that things are so close, I just needed half point out of two games to get the I am norm. And that all, that was also enough to win the would be enough to win the tournament. In the end, I made one point and a half from those two games. But in the eighth round, I played again Danilo, against Danilo Shkuran, who is also from Ukraine, and he has beaten me in the Ukraine Ukrainian tournament like very very badly. So I was like, uh, this was I was very impressed by his game, and I knew that it would be a difficult game for me. But uh, but I, so that was a game where I tried to play it safely. And I was playing with White. We played Karokan. I exchanged on D5 to, you know, to simplify the structure. Usually, it's not a good advice against playing against the stronger opponents to simplify. I think, uh, but in that case, I was like trying to control the position all the time. Uh, and luckily, we f- I found a line where either he let me, you know, he let me get with my queen to his into his between his pawns, or we repeat. Uh, so we went for the repetition, and that was the moment where you know I, I, I secured my norm and I secured the win in the tournament. Uh, so this is the draw which I kind of, uh, which I'm okay with because that was giving me a lot of you know, benefits. And so, how did it feel when either when you got the norm or after you finished the tournament and won the tournament? Like, uh, has it fully sunk in yet? Oh, that was amazing! I think I still have this feeling. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't know. It's like you're high all the time. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I mean, all that hard work uh, showing some dividends. That's awesome, and I know uh, a lot of listeners will be hopefully inspired. I know that that I'm inspired. Not quite inspired enough to start studying chess ten hours a week, but <laughs> but I'll get there. <laughs> um, so another question that i realized i forgot to hit on was just what what about game analysis like are you always looking at your games with your coaches do you look on your own when do you use the engine stuff like that what's your approach with looking at your own games Mm, so when i'm just after a tournament uh, instead of uh, reviewing the kasparov games or the Zurich games i go through my games Uh, so that's like this is the replacement um i do it first on my own uh and only after that i go through some of them with my coach uh, I try not to use the engine like almost at all that was also an advice from Bartosz um, and this works for me well the only problem is that usually after the game people uh, like write to me on messenger oh you know in the 60 second move you should have played this and this because that was winning quicker so usually I <laughs> we, even without wanting uh, I, I know about the you know, critical moments where I did it wrong or when I open the chess bomb, and the chess bomb has all those uh, moves highlighted in red, and then I can, and I already know. Okay, so this was the moment where I didn't play the correct moves. So this is, I would prefer like not to be tempted to open the chess bomb, but usually, you know, it's it's it, this is, this is happening. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you're tempted because for me, when I play a game, and then there's some like you know that classic moment where you feel like you know there's something in the position, and then maybe you find it, maybe you don't, but. 
when I get done a game, I always want to check the engine like right away and often succumb to that urge. Do do you have that urge when a game ends? Yeah, but I know this is really bad for my chest, so I'm trying to you know resist somehow. Um, that was an an addiction that I've had in the past, and I, you know, every game on the engine immediately after a game. Now, now I'm not doing this. Um. Okay. So I feel like we've we've weaved together a you know sort of. In closing, I just there's like two main things I want to touch before. Well, three things, Andre. I want to talk about book recommendations in a second. Um, your upcoming tournaments, and then if we can try to do, I know you did a bit of this on the chess Reddit, but maybe try to isolate a few bullet points for people. Um, so let's get to book recommendations. I mean, obviously, you know, there's so many, but um, if say you could, you give one or two recommendations for someone under two thousand, and one or two for someone over. Uh, oh, dividing this like this is interesting. I noticed on, on your podcast that my system book is, is you know, always an important theme, whether I'm a fan or not. Uh, yeah, not I my think, favorite. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm a fan overall, and I have like uh, Russian edition, Polish edition, and German edition. So I like the. I, the, I know there are many problems with that book and all with certain techniques in that book and certain the quality of some moves. But I, I think I overall like the you know the number of ideas that are shown. So I appreciate you know, the the work by um, by Aaron Imsovich. But uh, overall, I am I'm 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 a fan. I would say it's not a book that I come back very often. But usually, I like to scan the book and re- just you know look at some random page, and it does you know give me some good ideas uh, also. So my system, I think for for lower rated players, I think it'd be good. Maybe for stronger players, it's not really a great book. Um, for uh, so another book for lower tier players, uh, I think the Kasparov. Um, what's the English title? Kasparov predecessors. Predecessors. What's, what's my great there? predecessors? Yeah. Yes, my great predecessors. I think that's overall for both lower rated and high rated. I think there those would be good. Uh, while f- for me the best series now is the Kasparov on Kasparov. So there's like three. Uh, three big books, and I going th- I'm going through them right now. Uh, so overall, the work of Kasparov, I'm a big fan. Mm. Okay, and you mentioned um, somewhere on Reddit, move first, think later. Uh, I yes, think that's, that's what it's... Willie that, Edgard? That, Maybe yeah. it's translated differently? I've, yeah, I, I've read that book, and I, I liked it, so I, I can recommend it. And there was another book, which I, I remember I read both of them at the same time. Uh, it was the From Amateur to International Master. Yeah, yeah, which John Bartholomew also recommended, um, uh, Hawkins, right? Yeah, yeah, I don't, that yeah. was a good book, and I think it gave me some confidence, because, you know, when I when I went through that book, I was like, hmm, there's nothing really that much. No, I don't see really things that I wouldn't really know. Right. So maybe this I am title is really not that impossible for me, and you know th- this kind of books that are helping me in my they ha- they are helping my confidence. That's great. Uh, yeah, and and so yeah, both those books like uh, move first, think later, and the, uh, the those two books I, I read them at the same time and they were really really uh, helping me. Okay, and when you do read a chess book within the overall framework of your studying. Like, how does that fit into the picture? Is like a move like, I mean, a book, a book like uh, Hawkins' book. Would that be something that you wake up early to study in isolation, or is that something you kind of thumb through and you know read when you can grab fifteen twenty minutes at a time? Yeah, later? more like more like that. Yeah, so more the I latter. Get, okay. Yeah, and I try to read like whatever is possible about chess. You know, even even if it's just lazy learning or lazy reading. Uh, and I read all kinds of books. So I also read, for example, one once you had this guest from oh, I don't remember the name now, Gormley. Yeah, Danny Gormley. Yeah. Yeah, and you no, know, there was this you know unusual book I would say, uh, but it was a very good read, very interesting read to you know to read a, a life, uh, you know, the struggles of uh, being a grandmaster. Uh, so I've read that one too, and that was really good. And I, I'm, I'm, I think now my all my reading list comes from you again. <laughs> advertisement comes from your podcast. So uh, I just uh, list. I'm, I'm still listening to the to the episode with Alisa. Mm-hmm. Uh, Malakina, yeah, 
Yeah, and she uh, she wrote that reality check books, and I just bought it like yesterday, and I started reading it, you know, in my free time. Uh, so whatever it has some connections to chess, mm-hmm. I, I like to like immerse in the world of chess. Yeah, the uh, the recommended book list on the web page is getting unwieldy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what to do with it because it's like I want it to be all. I I feel like I need a better format, but um, because it, it's just you scroll down forever, and I don't know about putting it on separate pages. But anyway, that's kind of a pointless aside. Um, so what tournament? What's your schedule like coming up? Uh, sorry, can I can I so- add something to the book? Oh, of course, yeah. Uh, because I think this this is an amazing one. The the Sergey Shipov uh, series on Hedgehog. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I like Hedgehog, and I was playing Hedgehog for for many years. It's a very like complicated structure, and even in that last tournament, I played two Hedgehogs, so it then gave me one and a half point. And I love the the structure of the ship of books because it's it's I think it's unusual. Like he's showing some bad lines first, and he's explaining why this is a bad line, and then slowly, slowly you get to the right line. And this this helps me like memorizing why something was good or bad because I knew like the order. And there, there's like a good narration overall. So the Sergey ship of books are really good. And uh, uh, for opening lines, I I always you know blindly go for the quality chess books. Oh, yeah, they're great books. And that that actually reminded me of another question I meant to follow up with. Um, during a tournament, how much preparation are you doing for a specific opponent? So during a tournament, I will spend, I don't know, half an hour or one hour. Uh, and it's funny because this was my first round. It was overall my fourth round robin. And it was my first when I almost had like nothing prepared before the tournament. Uh, for those, even though I knew the opponents, I knew the colors. I just didn't prepare at all, uh, and so it was surprisingly you know, working well. Um, but that, that the run robin was like two games every day, which, as for I think European standards, is not a common thing usually. I think now it's more common, but it wasn't like that before. So it's very uh, exhausting overall. Uh, not much time left for preparation, but at, you know, the half an hour or one hour before the game, I will try to to see something. Uh, but overall, in this tournament, somehow all the opponents almost surprised me with their opening choice. So I I would have the same result, I think, even if I, without preparing, because it really wasn't preparing that much if they changed their lines. Yeah, I I would say similar to opening study generally. I would say if anything. That might be something that lower-rated players overemphasize. It's obviously important at the higher levels, but but I think it's more important to be in a good frame of mind and manage your energy levels and stuff like that um, at the lower levels. Uh, so what's next, Andre? Um, yeah, so summer uh, is almost here, and uh, I will play many tournaments, many friends, and you know, suggest me that I should play more so that maybe I can be able to... <laughs> Uh, gain another norm, but I'm not focusing on that. I'm just, you know, I want to play frequently. Uh, the next tournament is in June for me. Uh, that will be a, a team competition. Uh, it's funny because I will play with my wife in one team. My wife is also a chess player, which helps a lot <laughs> because mm-hmm. she, under- she understands what it means to be a chess player. She understands what, what it means to go for, an, for a tournament, to prepare, and so on. So it, she is uh, 1900. Um, and we will play in one team that's like a Polish finals of a certain team competition. Uh, so we hope to get you know the first place uh, finally because we usually we are usually like fifth or sixth. Mm, and then I will go the, in Warsaw in Poland. There is this big tournament called Nydorf Memorial, um, and I'm tr- I'm I, I I think I will play there. Uh, in Warsaw, then in uh, August I will play in Suwałki. There is a Warakomska Memorial, uh, also in Poland. And in September I will play. My team plays in the second Polish league, and I will be uh, playing on the first board. So that's that's the tournament. So one tournament a month. Cool. Overall. Well, I hope that you can find a way. To, I'm sure you'll have some people who'll be interested in tracking your progress. I know that you mentioned in the Reddit thread that your YouTube videos had fallen by the wayside a little bit, and I can certainly, I can relate to that. But is that do you have you have a Facebook page, right, where people can track? Like, what's the best way to follow your results? 
I think the Facebook page uh, is the best one. So it's called From 2100 to International Master. And I'm, I like learned to be quite systematic over there and with posting some updates. Uh, so, for example, during the turn- the, that tournament where I was so successful, I posted an update after every game. Oh, wow. I, okay. usually try, I, I tried to post one position, you know, one interesting moment to describe my I don't know, feelings or thoughts about this position. And, and that way, my, all my friends and all my supporters were able to you know, follow me. And, you know, somehow I, I, I just want to you know, finish also this with I know this is uh, like I've had a great result, but I know this is just you know, the beginning probably. Uh, and uh, beginning in the meaning that I, I'm not there yet. I'm still mm-hmm. a player with many weaknesses. And even though I've had a big, really great rating performance, I, and I would like to repeat that rating performance, I know that I'm not there yet. I don't des- des- deserve such successes like every month. So I, I need to put a lot of work uh, still. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I, I think I became aware now that somehow, in the, for example, among the Polish players, I'm because I've had an interview recently as well for for one Polish medium. Um, uh, I'm. Uh, it's good that it's nice that you know my example can motivate people. I I, I think I'm aware that suddenly I'm I became that person. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's surprising to me, uh, but I think I. I'm happy that I can play this role because I, I think what I wanted to show is that even at my age, I, I'm 38, you can uh, you can still improve even after decades of stagnation. You can still improve. So if that this helps people, then I'm very happy about it. Yeah, I think that's exactly the kind of motivation that a lot of listeners are looking for. So uh, I really appreciate um, your your taking the time, Andre. Yeah, it was great, and thank you for inviting me. Sure. And listeners, let me know what you guys think of this. If you want more of it, less of it, because uh, this is something, I mean, there, I definitely have other ideas and I will be contacting one. We'll definitely be doing more, but um, this is sort of a, a deeper, you know, we went, we went, we dug much deeper on how to improve at chess. And I, I've, you know, I sent that survey out. So I have some idea how active people are. Um, in terms of him of uh, wanting to get better at chess, but it's also not everyone. Everyone like other people are love chess and are interested in it more more like me at this stage, but aren't um, just aren't studying at this particular moment in their life. So anyway, uh, let me know what you guys think, and we'll definitely be watching, Andre. Um, let's just leave uh, with bullet points. So um, what's so what are your three biggest, like three biggest things for people to get better at chess, just to put you on the spot a bit. <laughs> uh, calculation, mm-hmm. the first one. Second would be the, the, you know, the physical condition, so exercises. Uh, you know, being in a good shape overall. Uh, the third thing, I, uh, what helped me a lot was, uh, you know, watching and being friends with other people who were there just before me. So I have some friends who made the I am norm. I, I lived in the in the hotel with the, with a chess player who during the tournament made the I am norm. So I was able to see all of this. So if the I am norm was my goal, I know it was good to be very close to people who achieved that. Okay, excellent advice. Yeah, chess can be a lonely pursuit. So it's definitely good to have people that you feel invested in and can show you the way and vice versa. Yeah. Um, all right. Thanks a lot, Andre. We'll definitely be uh, cheering for you and rooting you on. And obviously, if and when you get that IM title, we, we, we're going to have to have you back on. So uh, circle it on your calendar. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thanks for you know, making this podcast. It's really helpful for my, my chess career and I'm pretty sure for other people's careers too. Cool. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Thanks. The new Perpetual Chess theme music is courtesy of Geert van der Velt. Special shout out to him. I also want to thank everyone who supports the podcast. That includes people who tell their friends about it, people who write positive reviews on Apple Podcasts, and most of all those who have donated to support the show. I spend about five hours a week on each episode, and even though I love doing it, it can be hard to find the time. Without the support of my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Chess partners, the show would not be possible. They are... Adam Ralph, Adam Van Coolge, Adrian Gutierrez, Andres Crisdua. I hope I did okay there, Andres, on your name. Alex Pejas, Chris Wainscott, Chad Hilton, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, Daniel Naylor, 
Daniel Schaefer, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, James Banastia, Jason Dunbar, Jennifer Valens, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, Jen Shahadi, Jen Scream, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passy, Macaulay Peterson, Matthew Tedesco, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchak, Robert Steiner, Tatia Vabrahamian, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotello, Victor Vrenkul, Zhao Cheng, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll be back next week with another great...